Okay, so in this video, I want to prove a theorem about intersections of closed sets and use it to construct a, an example of a very famous and very special set called the Cantor set, which um, as strange as it might seem, the Cantor set is actually very important to us in constructing certain um, special pathological functions that have very strange properties. So the Cantor function actually is a uh, the primary example of a function constructed using the Cantor set and it has some very strange analytical properties that we'll get to later but it's so it's actually somewhat it's not just a novelty it's it's important to be familiar with the Cantor set so um to so the Cantor set is constructed as an infinite intersection so the Cantor set is an infinite intersection oops of closed sets so we want to we're going to prove a theorem about infinite intersections of closed sets which shows that they're not empty one remark that i have here is that um arbitrary intersections of closed sets are closed, okay? This is because, because arbitrary unions of open sets are open, okay? This is because there's a relationship, sorry, arbitrary. There's a relationship between intersections and unions when you take complements basically okay which is that if you take the complement of an intersection of a bunch of closed sets that's the same thing as taking the union of all the complements of those different closed sets right so if you take the complement of the intersection what you get is the union of complements of closed sets which means it's a union of open sets right which means that it's open so that means that the complement of the intersection of all the closed sets is open, which means that the intersection itself is closed, okay? Um, I'm not gonna belabor that because I think it's actually a homework exercise and it's a really good um, thing to get used to about intersections, unions, and complements. Um, it's like super handy, you'll have to use it all the time. So, uh, okay, so this means that the Cantor set is closed basically, all right? Anyway, so, um, this is, uh, so I'm gonna prove this theorem now. Let Fn be a sequence, a decreasing quote unquote, okay, let me tell you what this means in a second, uh, sequence uh, of closed bounded non-empty sets in rk okay uh, so by c decreasing what we mean here right because they're sets so like what does it mean for sets to decrease what it really means is that um f1 contains f2 which contains F3 and so on, right? Uh, so then, so it's this basically descending chain is, a, is actually a more common term for something like this, a descending chain of closed sets. Then the intersection, if we call that F, the intersection from N equals one to infinity of Fn is also, closed bounded and non-empty okay i want to just say two like just a couple words here because i know this is something that's confusing for a lot of people when they first see it this kind of intersection when you have a descending chain of sets you might think that it's sort of like a, a weirdly trivial thing because like if you take the intersection of of the first like you know 10 of these or whatever because they, they're all like contained in each other, the intersection of the first 10 would just be like F10, right? The intersection of the first two is just F2, 
the intersection of the first three is just F3. The intersection of the first like 30 is just F30, right? So what, what, is it, what actually happens when you take the intersection of all of them? Wouldn't that just be like F infinity or something, right? But that's like, you can't think about it like that because F infinity doesn't exist. I mean, we haven't defined F infinity. What is that, right? No, the intersection here is just the set of points which happen to be common to every single one of these at the same time, right? So there's no terminal like set here it's just, you just have to think about it differently. Okay, so don't get caught up thinking about this intersection as like equaling one of these sets somehow because it doesn't. It's possible that the intersection of all of these is like totally different from any one of the like individual sets themselves, okay? In fact, we've already seen that with like, you know, if you take the intersection of all those like uh, closed or open intervals, right? Uh, from like negative one over N to one over N, like those are all open intervals. So, but like their, their intersection, the intersection of all of them is not an open interval. It's just like one point, right? So the intersection of all these things looks kind of weird and it's something you have to think about carefully. Um, okay, so the proof here, the closed and boundedness are obvious, okay? Like I just said, um, arbitrary intersections of closed sets are closed. So that's why this is a, so F has to be closed because all the FN are closed. So that's just a sort of automatic from up here. The boundedness is also obvious because actually if F1 is bounded, then uh, you know the intersection is a subset of that. So it also has to be bounded, right? Uh, so those are actually not the difficult things. We wanna show that F is non-empty. That's the interesting thing there has to be at least one point which is in common for all of these, okay? Um, so this, uh, so for each n, select xn uh, in fn. All right, sorry, I had to make a cut because, uh, so the notation they use here is, is the notation they use in the book, I think, is uh, rather confusing, and they don't do a great job of explaining the argument. So I'm going to do my best to try to make this easier for you guys to understand. Um, so what they say, so, well, okay, the, the argument goes like this, right? So um, xn is a bounded sequence. So then xn is a bounded sequence. So balzano weierstrass tells us um, there exists a subsequence and they call it XNNM instead of NK. So they have to do N sub M here because um, K we already used for the dimension of the space, unfortunately. So it's XNM, that's the sub subsequence of XN which converges, right? To X naught in RK, right? Okay, so now uh, we want to show that X naught is in F. So to show that X naught is in F, it's enough to show that X naught, so really we wanna show that X naught is in F. I'm gonna just call it L for all L. Or maybe instead of L, I'll use J. Let's use J. So F J for all J in N. Okay, so let's uh, let's do that. So we want to show X naught. So remember, X naught is the limit of X N M, the subsequence of X N, right? So we want to show that X naught is in F J for all J in N. So let j in n, we're going to show that x naught is in fj, right? Um, so how do we do this? Well, what we can do is say, um, well, for, you know, for sufficiently, I'm going to say this, for sufficiently large m, um, 
nm is greater than j. So um, x n m is uh, is in f n m right, which is a subset of f j. For let's say so instead, let me say um, instead of for sufficiently large m, I'm going to say this. So there exists some uh, capital N such that for M greater than capital N, we have NM bigger than J, right? Because NM has to, NM is just like the sequence of indices of the subsequence. So that has to approach infinity. So eventually NM gets bigger than J, right? So then uh, what, so we're just saying M, M is just the index where like NM gets bigger than J. And then once that's true, FNM, right? Because the, these are, it's a descending chain. FNM is a subset of FJ for all these big values of NM. So XNM is actually in FJ for um, M greater than N. Um, so, so, right, so XNM is in FJ uh, for M greater than M. Like XNM is in FJ, right? That's what I'm saying here. XNM is in FJ for M greater than N. Um, so, by 13.9, right? Um, the limit of x and m as m goes to, sorry, as m goes to infinity is also in fj uh, because fj is closed, right? So this sequence, what we're saying is that the sequence beyond a certain point, the sequence stays inside of fj so the limit also has to be an FJ. That's the basic idea, right? So then uh, this tells us that XNM, so, um, so, or sorry, this tells us that X naught is in FJ um, since J was arbitrary. Um, that tells us that uh, X naught is in F, okay? So that's the proof uh, that the infinite intersection of non-empty closed bounded sets is also non-empty and closed and bounded. So the non-emptiness thing is really what's important here. So let me just uh, now quickly to show you how we apply this to construct the Cantor set. So, so um, example, Cantor set, okay. Uh, let me draw a picture. So I'm going to make a cut here again. Okay, so basically I drew a picture. It's actually pretty much the same as the diagram, figure 13.1 on page 90 in the book. Um, but basically this shows you uh, an example of an application of this theorem we just proved where, so in this case, F1 is the, inter the closed interval, right? These are all closed intervals the closed interval from, from zero to one, and then to get each like FK, you just sort of delete the middle third of every interval in the previous one. So like F2, you delete the middle third of the whole interval. F3, you delete the middle third of these two intervals that you have now. F4, you delete the middle third of each of those and so on, right? So it's pretty clear from the construction that like each one of these is a subset of the previous one and uh, they're all closed, they're all bounded and they're all non-empty. So um, the Cantor set is non. The Cantor set is what you get by taking the intersection of all of these, of course. So the Cantor set is non-empty by the preceding theorem. Okay. Um, for now, that's about as much as you have to know about it. Um, some interesting properties are that it is um, uncountable. but length zero, right? The length of the total length of the intervals decreases by a factor of two thirds every time, right? So the total length of the Cantor set, I mean, we haven't really defined what that means, but intuitively it should be zero, but it actually still has uh, what we call an uncountable number of points, although I haven't really defined that either. But for those of you with any familiarity with these uh, terms, um, you, you might find this kind of an, a strange exotic set because it has this uh, counterintuitive collection of properties. 
that will become kind of important for us later when we define the Cantor function, which like I said, has some very strange and interesting properties. So that's all about the Cantor set. Um, in the next section, I will talk about compactness and the Heine-Borel theorem.